we talked about heating a greenhouse, now I'm going to talk about cooling a greenhouse. And cooling a greenhouse, it, especially in the summertime, is very important for you to be able to have a productive greenhouse. So why do we need to cool a greenhouse? Well, um, we get exposed to 277 BTUs per square foot per hour on any summer day. Uh, now, it's where there's lots of cloud or pollution or something that's to be lower, of course. Uh, but about 85% of this energy actually enters into the greenhouse, is transmitted into the greenhouse. And uh, when it, the electromagnetic energy is absorbed by the surfaces and the materials, uh, the particles in air, it's re-radiated as infrared energy and it's trapped. And this is what increases our greenhouse temperature. This is why I like to say that greenhouses are a solar collector. And that's exactly what we're using it for. So we need to uh, get that heat or have provide some kind of a mechanism to get the trapped heat out of our greenhouse in order to be able to effectively grow plants. I showed you this, this graphic with the uh, lecture before the last one where we have the sun generating all this energy into our greenhouse and then it's trapped. So we need to get that, that out. And there's two kinds of cooling that we particularly look at. We talk about summer cooling and we talk about winter cooling. And we're going to talk about each one in, in, in independently. Now summer heat, um, summer, the summer heat accumulation, the biggest gain that we had in the, in the greenhouse industry probably in the last 75 years is uh, by using what we call active evaporative cooling. And we're currently using two forms of evaporative cooling today. One is what we call fan and pad cooling and the, one is, and the other one is fog. Now these are active in that we're pr using a mechanical device to create the cooling. We don't use, um, well, some research facilities might. We don't use uh, refrigeration technology to cool greenhouses just because it's so, so expensive. For instance, if you, a grower that would use refrigeration like we would use in our home or our apartments or something like that would have to have such a large cooling plant that it would be cost prohibitive. If you're looking at a category four containment or something like this where you can't have any air in or out of that greenhouse, then you would have to resort to something like that. So um, we also need to get that heat out of the greenhouse in the wintertime and we use a slightly different construction technology for that kind of uh, cooling for winter cooling. So there are a couple of different ways to look at cooling. There's passive ventilator cooling, which requires no machinery, but then there is active pan and fad systems that need to be designed based upon a rate of air exchange with pads, fan placement, air stream, and such as that. <coughs> as well as the fog systems. So to talk first about passive cooling, in our um, traditional greenhouses, we typically see temperatures 20 degrees plus uh, inside the greenhouse compared to outside the greenhouse in the summer months. So if it's 80 degrees outside, it's obviously going to be more than 100 degrees inside. And the old style greenhouses, we worked with ridge vents, and the ridge vents were designed to open up only about 10% of that surface area of the roof to let the hot air out. Newer, more uh, better passive cooling systems, we actually opened the ridge vents 20 to 40%. And what this allows us to do is to keep our indoor temperatures more closely aligned to the outdoor temperatures and it gives us a little bit of a better cooling system. So the way a passive cooling system works is we have our ridge vents running the top of the ridge, obviously, and then we have side vents along the side. Now the idea is heat rises, and the adiabatic currents inside the greenhouse, as the heat rises, the heat moves out through the top of the greenhouse and draws in the cool air through the side. And if um, under moderately warm conditions, quite often this is 
usually adequate. Another form of passive cooling can be increased with crops that are three-dimensional in nature. This is a photograph of a greenhouse tomato operation where you can see um, we have a 10-foot high on trellises uh, tomato crop. Now think of that all of that surface area of those leaves as evaporative coolers. And as that energy is evaporating off that, actually by using a large scale crop like this, like a tomatoes, with the passive venting, most of these kinds of greenhouses don't require any pads or fans. So it's a passively cool greenhouse using the crop itself to cool itself. Now if this greenhouse is empty, it doesn't work. Question. Do you need fans to like spread the pollination? Do you need fans to spread the pollination? And actually, Tomatoes are not wind pollinated. Tomatoes are insect pollinated. Okay. <laughs> and a tomato crop requires uh, you either do hand pollination, which in a 20 acre operation, it would take lots and lots of people. So we employ a very, very inexpensive labor force to do that pollination, and they're called bumblebees. So we actually put bees in the greenhouse, and they do the pollination. But cucumbers are wind pollinated, right? Cucumbers are wind pollinated, but oftentimes we use bumblebees in there as well. The wind, to get the amount of wind in an operation like this to move that much pollen around is very inefficient. Do they have the hive in the greenhouse or do they just leave like areas for the bees to fly? The hives are inside the greenhouse and actually there are companies that market and sell and we use Bombus and Patience. That's the most uh, efficient bumblebee for pollinating um, greenhouse crops. And um, the hives are commercially sold with the queen, with the workers, the whole with uh, a food source, uh, the food source is called it's a it's a it's a sweetened nectar compound. Um, the growers call it bee happy, uh, but also growers will go around and collect pollen and feed the bees pollen as well. Now we use bumblebees in greenhouses because honeybees are too aggressive. Honeybees are very aggressive and. Whereas bumblebees, you're not so likely to be stung. I've been working in greenhouses like this for 25 years, and I've only been stung three times. So, and it's usually when I'm opening up a hive to show students. So I was asking for it. But um, honeybees, we don't use honeybees because they're much more aggressive. They're more uh, likely to defend their hive if you get close. And also, bumblebees are kind of lazy. They don't leave the greenhouse. Honeybees will forage as much as five miles. So um, <coughs> anyway, so that's what we use to do the pollination. Good question. So other kinds of passive cooling system, just roll up sidewalls, roof ventilators, uh, retractable curtain, retractable roof greenhouses where you can actually open up the whole greenhouse complex. Uh, retractable curtains, we can move them up or down with a winch. Um, you can use a winch or I've seen uh, systems where they just roll it up on a pipe and have a, a crank on the pipe. D it doesn't have to be very fancy. Uh, here we have a, in this uh, sawtooth greenhouse, we have a drop, root, drop wall and they just come up and down with a little motor. So for instance, an operation like this uh, probably doesn't use any fans at all because it's using the adiabatic currents, it's using the, the winds coming across the top of the greenhouse to pull all the air through. So passively cooled greenhouses are very efficient. Here's another example of a side vent. Of course, I love this picture because it shows pretty much a bright spot in the greenhouse and yes, there is a little surge of plant growth right underneath that light beam, so it's a little uneven. But this is, uh, you can see how these side vents open up and another view of the sawtooth. Another greenhouse is the open roof design. This particular operation um, has no other cooling system other than these open roofs and, and in fact it has a flood floor and if, if the uh, greenhouse was to get too warm they would flood the floor and you'd have that huge evaporative surface to cool the greenhouse. As well as shading systems, here's another view of a retractable 
curtain system, <coughs> retractable roof, opening and closing, uh, very efficient. Uh, there's a couple articles in, I think, in the week two readings on retractable from Sven Svensson. Yes, that is his real name, Sven Svensson. But most greenhouses are designed with a vent. And vents, uh, even today, even if you're uh, building with a, um, a, a traditional greenhouse design with uh, active cooling, with fans and pads and such as that, it's always a good plan to go ahead and include a vent system in your greenhouse design in addition to anything else. That way you don't always have to rely on one type of cooling system. <coughs> it could be in what's called a staged cooling system, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about envir environmental control technologies. So why do we use passive cooling? Well, obviously they're cheaper to run. They're not going to require a motor that's going to run your electric bill up. You can get vent actuators that actually work open and close based upon the expansion and contract expansion and contraction of gases in a cylinder where the heat can open up the the vent itself and these are quite common on hobby greenhouses where you don't have electricity and just use a, a little gas um, gas cylinder open or close it or you can put in hand cranks um, to do but if hand cranks require you to do something uh, somebody go in and open or close the vent Active cooling systems take advantage of the absorption of heat from the air as we evaporate water. And um, this is, these are the most common systems that we use for greenhouse cooling. And the two types of systems we're going to talk about are fan and pad and fog. So an active design system, we should be able to lower the temperature of the incoming air that's being drawn into the greenhouse by 80% of the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperatures. <coughs> Do you know what dry bulb and wet bulb temperature means? A lot of people don't. The dry bulb temperature is the actual temperature measured with a thermometer. The wet bulb temperature is that air temperature, if enough water were to be evaporated into it, into the air to saturate that air mass. Okay. <coughs> so, how do we measure that? We use a device called a psychrometer. And the psychrometer is basically a wet sock on a thermometer. And this is, a, this is called a sling psychrometer. And I've got a little video somewhere on YouTube or something that I think is attached in your notes. Uh, this is called a sling psychrometer. It's not a Mardi Gras party favor. And what it has is I have two mercury thermometers, which are very accurate. I remember when you're using mercury thermometers, if you whack it on something, you sling mercury everywhere. But on your um, right-hand side, you see uh, a this is called a dry bulb, okay? On the left hand side we have a little cotton sock and it goes into a, a water vessel that's under in the side of this cap and I've s uh, filled it up with water. Now what I do is I need to move this round, I mean to, need to spin this through the air so that the evaporation surface happens, so the evaporation happens and it cools this thermometer. Just like when you got out of the shower this morning, to a shower right? No? Oh, I don't want to hear. I'm going over here. Um, when, you t when you got out of the shower, you were chilled. You were chilled because the water was evaporating off of your skin. Okay? So it's taking that energy out. So we take this air and we move it across the sock. We allow for evaporative cooling. And I can sp spin this really well. Hmm? Oh, just for about a minute. I'm not going to Carnival. All right. All right, so the dry bulb temperature is, in this room, is 76. 
and I can't read it. And the wet bulb temperature is 63. Okay? So, the difference between those temperatures is what? 68 minus, no, 78 minus 63 is what? How much? 15 degrees. Okay. So 80% of 15 is? Hmm? What? 12.5. 12.5, okay. So I can actually cool that air 12.5 degrees by pushing, pulling it through a, um, uh, a by taking it through an evaporative cooling system. So that's how much we, so it's, it's actually limited to the um, air temperature coming in. And of course it's limited by the um, temperature and the humidity. So a fan and pad system, typically we can, we can, if it's designed correctly, get it to about 80% efficiency. Fog systems are just a fraction more efficient, actually a major fraction, they can cool it to 95%. So this is all related to what we call relative humidity. And relative humidity is uh, measured with a sling psychrometer where we have, we take the wet bulb temperature and we take the dry bulb temperature. And this is called a Mollier chart. Now the Mollier chart, this has been around for um, centuries, <coughs> at least decades. And this example, I've got the dry bulb temperature at, um, and I know you can't read these numbers, at 90 degrees. So the bottom axis is the dry bulb temperature, so it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And for an example, I have chosen the wet bulb temperature, which goes up this curved line at uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And we take those lines and we intersect them together. <coughs> like this, and the, this is a cer cer separate gradation for relative humidity. So the relative humidity with uh, 90 degrees dry temperature, 75 degrees wet bulb temperature is 50%. Now what does that mean? That means 50% relative humidity means there, at that particular dry bulb temperature, there is enough moisture in the air only 50% of what the air can contain. One of the tools that we can use in the greenhouse to determine wet bulb temperature and use it to calculate relative humidity is a sling psychrometer. This is an old device but still very accurate. The one that I'm showing you here in the screen is a barrel with two uh, thermometers mounted inside. It has a uh, cotton sock that's been saturated with water on one side and bare open open bulb on the other side. The open bulb is the dry bulb. The cotton sock that's been saturated with water is what we call the wet bulb. To determine the wet bulb temperature we spin the we spin the thermometers through the air at a consistent speed and that passes air across the wet bulb and the dry bulb to determine an accurate temperature. The dry bulb temperature is 75 degrees. The wet bulb temperature is 57 degrees. This has a little scale on it that we can use to calculate the relative humidity. Put it together, a little scale on here, and we match the dry bulb temperature at 75 and the wet bulb temperature at 57. like so, and the relative humidity in this environment 
is 31%. That's how we use a sling psychrometer. All right. So we take we use the adiabatic uh, physics the adi to uh, evaporate water to take the sensible heat, the evaporation water to convert sensible heat into latent heat. That's how we're taking the sensible heat out of the air, evaporating the water and taking the energy out and putting into the vapor the latent heat. And for every pound of water that we evaporate, we're tip we're pulling out over a thousand BTUs of energy. And that's how we cool a greenhouse. So this lowers the, lowers the temperature of the air and increases the water vapor content. So we're transferring the energy of the heat of the air into the energy of the water vapor. Now this also increases the relative humidity. So relative humidity, for instance, is something that changes because it's relative to the dry bulb temperature and the volume of water in the air. Now the volume of the water in the air is actually fairly difficult to change. The dry bulb temperature fluctuates a lot. So actually the volume of water and the wet bulb temperature doesn't change that much. But what happens when the dry bulb temperature falls and comes to the same level as the wet bulb temperature. Can you imagine what happens? Because as that dry bulb temperature drops and the wet bulb temperature stays the same, the relative humidity goes up. And when they're equal, what happens? We have dew. That's when we have condensation. And if that falls, if it's below freezing, we have frost on your windshield, okay? Pretty simple. So what we're doing is we're taking this adiabatic cooling process to cool our greenhouse. And the ability to reduce the sensible heat of that air depends on how much water we can evaporate. So the higher the humidity, the less, of course, we can evaporate into it. Therefore, at low relative humidity climates, like Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, places like that, evaporative cooling systems work extremely efficiently. In Florida, not so much. They do work, but not so much. So on a daily basis, the relative humidity fluctuates from 100% to 15% in the wintertime all the time. We bring in cold air this time of year, <coughs> We heat the air up with our climate controlled homes. The relative humidity inside is going to be very, very low. That's why my wife insists on a humidifier in the house. Okay? That's why it's drier. And if I was to drag my feet across the thing and touch you on the nose, I'd give you a little zap. But that's abuse. So the original temperature of the air the sensible heat measured by the dry bulb temperature. The warmer the air, the more the water, the more the air is capable of holding. Okay? The relative humidity, if the wet bulb temperature stays the same, we can evaporate more water into it. So if we look back at this chart again, we see on this far right axis that we're actually able to hold about 110 grains of moisture. And that's an old terminology, but you can convert that into pounds per cubic feet or whatever you want to do. So, depends on how much is already there in the air, in the, how much water is already in the air, and that's how we get the efficiency. Now, other things that impact how efficient a uh, pad and fan cooling system, of course, includes the density of the air. So in other words, pad and fan cooling systems, evaporative cooling systems, are less efficient at altitude. Okay? So we need to take into, uh, into uh, context the abs ab out actual altitude and what the barometric pressure of the air is. So less dense air, of course, we need to have a higher volume of air moving through our greenhouse 
so we have to modify our fan design. And of course, de depends on the efficiency of the system. Pad and fan systems, 80%. Fog cooling systems, 